Well, hello there, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Topic UFO. Today, we're going to be talking about the Warminster UFO, uh, which, of course, took place over in the UK starting back in the 1960s. Our guest is Kevin Goodman, who is a ufologist and author, who's written a book about this. And we're going to be uh, getting his insight and experiences uh, in regards to this UFO flap that, uh, from what I understand, is uh, fairly famous over in the UK. So uh, without any further ado, uh, Mr. Kevin Goodman, are you out there, sir? I certainly am, Rick. Good evening. Hey, glad to finally get you on here. So, uh, Kevin, uh, I've, I've looked over... Uh, the website and and uh, some other sites on the web uh, regarding this Warminster uh, UFO flap. I guess they refer to it as a, a UFO flap. Um, and uh, this is a fairly famous uh, UFO incident over in the UK, is it not? It is, Rick, but um, I, I, I don't know if the word flap can be actually used. Uh, to give you a, a very brief insight, uh, the phenomenon actually started on uh, Christmas Eve, stroke Christmas Day 1964, and it carried on through probably until the late 1970s due to the amount of sightings which was were, were in the area. So... Um Starting back in the 60s, uh, now, am I correct when I say that um, unlike most UFO incidences, this started out with not a visual incident, but more of an audio uh, incident where people were hearing strange sounds? Is that correct or... Yeah, that, that's right. Um, I mean, Warminster itself probably encapsulates the entire UFO phenomenon, um, a bar one or two uh, incidents such as abductions and cattle mutilations. The, the sounds themselves were supposedly akin to having shingle pulled onto roofs. Um, and it was reported for about six months before the actual full manifestation of the UFO phenomenon actually started. So, and just, just to ask you right off the bat, you know, I've never heard of a UFO incident that started off with sounds and then, you know, manifested into to this visual. Um, do you know of other, uh, any other UFO incidents that, that's done that type of thing? No, I don't, to be honest with you. Um, but researching into Warminster, uh, as I have done over the last few years, um, it's, it, it's akin to a social cultural phenomenon in so much that I think uh, Warminster happened at the right time. Um, you're talking in the mid-1960s, and there was a sort of start of the hippie movement later on, you know, 66, 67. Right. And a lot of people then actually sort of jumped on, not didn't jump on the bandwagon, that's the wrong expression to use probably. But they sort of, you know, it, was, it, it happened at the right time. People were looking for something, possibly looking to the skies rather than conventional religion. And it just took off in that way. Wow. Very strange. Very strange. Um... Uh, the other thing that I find uh, interesting about a uh, Warminster is that uh, w when it did manifest itself I into a visual uh, incident, this was mm -hmm. a, a cigar-shaped UFO, uh, correct? Yeah. Um, I mean, some of the descriptions that were given uh, a red-hot poker uh, stretching and then bursting asunder with an explosion, no sound... Uh, the, the, the man who actually championed the Warminster phenomenon, a local journalist by the name of Arthur Shuttlewood, uh, was a complete and utter disbeliever until one day he actually saw the phenomenon for himself out of his flat window. Wow. You know, it, isn't it funny how, how non-believers uh, become believers so quickly <laughs> after seeing well, something? Absolutely. I mean, uh, Shuttlewood himself, you know, uh, he, it's, it's a uh, rather famous uh, 
incident in that he actually supposedly recorded this cigar-shaped object out of this flat window, and nothing bar a few first frames actually came out because the rest of the film had been completely burnt out. Wow. Wow. Now, uh... I want to I want to get to to your uh, research involvement, but I, I want to ask you real quickly. Uh, so he took this uh, motion picture film, uh, mm-hmm. I take it, and you're saying that first few frames came out. Uh, what was the general uh, census of the people? Where did they think he was nuts? Did he think he was trying to hoax this? Uh, was it a fifty fifty type of thing? Uh, what was the public's reaction to to this, or to his initial story? Well, the, the, the public's reaction in the town itself was of complete indifference, really, to be quite honest with you. Um, in the August bank holiday period of 1965, the iconic uh, photograph uh, of the war the thing was taken by a young factory worker by the name of Gordon Faulkner. Um, and he claimed that he was just in the right place at the right time to take the picture. This was then sent to a national, a national daily newspaper in, in the United Kingdom called the Daily Mirror, uh, which ran a center, sprage, sorry, center page spread on it. And that's when, in this country at least, the warmest of phenomenon, sort of, if you'll pardon the rather obvious pun here, took off. <laughs> yes. Uh- and I noticed you, you mentioned the word thing. Uh, where did that come from? They, they call it the, they don't necessarily call it the, the War Minster UFO. They call it the War Minster, Minster thing. Yeah. And, um, and what is that all about? Well, um, War Minster is a very small, or in those days it was a small market town in Wiltshire. And a lot of the people around that area had no real knowledge of the ufo phenomenon so all these strange events that were happening they just seem to bracket as the thing ah so so their ufo really wasn't in their vocabulary so they they came up with thing huh yeah unbelievable well you know i i saw um a picture uh on the uh now, is this your website, the UFO uh, Warminster dot co dot uk? Is that your? Yeah, that's uh, it's it's run along with my co-author Steve Dewey, who also has written a book as well. But that that his book is more skeptical in nature than mine. Ah, okay. Well, on on your website, uh, there is a classic classic picture of you and uh, your friend from about nineteen seventy something. Uh, where it looks like, was that when you first started investigating this this thing? Yeah, it was, because uh, without giving too much away, I was born in 1959. So, obviously so was I. So was I. But, ah, ah, we have something in common. <laughs> yep. um, so uh, by the time I was old enough to get to Warminster, under my own steam, as it were, which was in 1976, I think, um, you know, the, the the phenomenon was dying down to a degree. I see, I see. But uh, you've been you've been involved with this since the late seventies, right, or before? Yeah, uh, since about nineteen seventy six, as I say, was when I first went down. And I mean, you know, my friends and I, we actually saw th- some things that we couldn't rationally explain even today. Um, so, you know, Warminster, I don't know why it was a focal for what it was, but it, you know, it obviously touched the hearts and minds of a great deal of people at that time. Wow. So, uh, you first went down there as, as a teenager or, or to this location as a teenager. Um, and I don't want to give away, uh, your book, which, which, by the way, is entitled uh, the, uh, the Cradle uh, uh, of, of, contact. of Contact, Cradle of Contact. Um, now, there was a blurb that I read about your book <clears throat> where, it, where it talks about you and, 
and a group of your friends went to investigate this and uh, and became involved somehow. Is that kind of the basis of the book? It is the basis of the book. I mean, one reviewer actually um, referred to the book as a non-fiction George Adamski book written in the style of um, Catches in the Rye. Ah. So it's, it's a sort of coming-of-age book uh, written from someone who was actually up on Cradle Hill, which was the main sky-watching location in Warminster from the mid-1970s through to the early 1980s. Ah, okay. Uh, so, can you give us just a a, a brief overview of um, of the entire uh, UFO story? I guess I, I know you said you don't you don't think it's it should be called a flap, but we know that it started back in the in the earlier mid sixties. Uh, people started hearing sounds and, and then how did it kind of progress from there uh, through the years? Well, it progressed um, through obviously with the then visual manifestations of these strange lights in the sky. Um, then obviously Gordon Faulkner's photograph, which, you know, to some degree has to be looked at with a certain amount of, of suspicion um, in so much that if you look at the actual photograph itself, we are talking in the age of obviously pre-digital photography mm -hmm. in that the photograph of the thing has been enlarged so much that every grain of silver halide is actually um, visible on the picture. So there is no great sort of veracity uh, you could put over onto the picture because there is no sense of scale. However, uh, Arthur Shuttlewood, who obviously by this time had become a believer in the UFO phenomenon, actually then... Uh, got a, 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 a group of people, like many people, with him, and they would spend many hours up on the hill watching the UFOs, seeing things, uh, so much so that the very famous British astronomer Patrick Moore visited the hill on two separate occasions with the BBC film crew um, to report on you know, the phenomenon as such. Uh, Shuttlewood actually wrote in total six books regarding the warmest of phenomenon. Um, and he obviously was the man who was tantamount in keeping the, the phenomenon in the public eye, so much so that the Rolling Stones apparently did a concert at Longleat House, which is just outside Warminster, um, and they themselves of, um, went up to Cradle Hill for a sky watch one night, along, it is reported, with members of the Moody Blues. So it was, as I said before, a cultural phenomenon, um, in so much that, you know, you would have people who would go up to the hill, they would see things, and they would go home and report to their friends and sort of say, you know, hey, you know, we went to Warminster, you know, UFO capital of the UK, we saw something. Those friends would go down, see something, they would then tell their friends, and the whole thing was then self-perpetuating for nearly 15 years. Wow. And, and just so... Uh we can get an idea of where Warminster is, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, l let's just say um, from London. Where, where is it located uh, in reference to, to London? To London, okay. It's about 84 miles west of London. Uh, it's in an area which has become known as the Wessex or the Warminster Triangle which includes areas such as Stonehenge, Glastonbury, and Avebury. So it's, it's in an area of Britain which is steeped in mythology. Well, I tell you, you know, for, for the size uh, that the UK is, uh, you seem to have a lot of UFO activity over there. I, you know, it kind of blows me away. But I did not know that it was uh, close to to the uh, Stonehenge as well. Um, so, what do you um, what do you attribute, uh, or can you attribute anything to these sightings? Um, the fact that it started off as sounds and then went to visual, and it lasted over, you know, a period of so many years. 
what are your thoughts on this? What what do you think it's all about? Well, if I knew the answers to that, Rick, I would be a very rich man. You wouldn't be talking to me, right? Oh, I talk to you. <laughs> um, as I said before, I think more wants to happen at the right time. The dawning of the age of Aquarius, for starters. Um, I was brought up as a very good little Catholic boy, and I rebelled against the church, and I started to look towards other reasons for our existence. And I was not the only one in that time. Mm -hmm. As I say, I mean, you know, I have organized for the last six years or so now um, an annual sky watch to be held on the August bank holiday, normally anyway, on the August bank holiday here in the UK on Cradle Hill, which is to sort of celebrate um, the, the past history of Warminster. And it's amazing the number of people who actually turn up who were there in the 1960s and in the 1970s. As I said before, it touched a great deal of people psychologically. I don't know. But there was obviously something that happened in that town that defies rational explanation. Now, I, I did read somewhere, I believe, that there is a military base somewhat close um, to Warminster. Any thoughts there as to a possible military link? There is possible. It's possible. Uh, I mean, where Cradle Hill is, it nestles right onto the Salisbury Plain training area. And Warminster is home to uh, what was then known as the School of Infantry. It's now known as the School of Land Warfare. Now, I would like to tell you the sighting that I had in Easter of 1977. Absolutely, please. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, unless anybody has been to Warminster, and I doubt that many people who listen to this probably have, but that is beside the point, um, a friend and I and I were walking down from the infamous Cops area at the top of Cradle Hill, and we looked across towards the golf club, which is on a hill uh, by the name of Elm Hill, and coming in from that direction, from over the town, were four red lights, equally distantly spaced apart. They then passed over an area called Cop Heap, which is uh, um, a hill just outside the town where it's reputed that an Anglo-Saxon um, chieftain is supposed to have been buried. Then passed on over to an area called Battlesbury Hill, which is directly in front of Cradle Hill. Now, these lights stayed in a complete horizontal line, just flashing red. And uh, they must have been in this line for about, I don't know, a minute, a minute and a half. And then the extreme left-hand object shot off at speed horizontally and then performed a flawless 90-degree turn without stopping and shot straight upwards. Now, this was in 1976. There is nothing that we have now militarily, that can perform any form of maneuver like that. If there was any, anything living on board that craft with the technology that we have today, they would have been strawberry jam. They're, yes, they would have been liquefied uh, due, to, due to the G-force of exactly. uh, that yeah. type of turn, right? Yeah. Now, um, were, uh, you were with a friend when this happened? Yes. Uh, and then after about a minute, after that first object shot off, the other three remaining objects then just shot straight up into the sky, out of sight. Now, weather conditions on that night were perfect. It was a cold, moonless night. Um, there was very little wind, and you could hear the trains going through Warminster Station, which is about a mile away from where we were standing. And these objects, whatever they were, didn't make a bloody sound. They were totally silent. There was no engine noise, nothing. Wow. I mean, what, what, what did you guys think when you saw this? Were you just stunned? I think stunned is, is a very polite word to you. <laughs> uh, we, just, we just stood there actually slack-jawed. And, and the interesting thing is that we were staying actually... Um, in a small cottage on the slopes of, um, of Cradle Hill, 
uh, with a woman who was working as a secretary at one of the farms in the area, and her daughter was uh, had come up with us, and she had not heard of the war mister phenomenon, and you know, she, uh, like us, she was just rooted to the spot. You know, you just think to yourself, what the hell have we just seen? I only wish that I someday will be able to to see something uh, such as what you saw. Um, it really must just uh, change your whole outlook on things to to see something that incredible. Uh, it does know. indeed. I mean, I, um, I can also, to your listeners, recommend another very good book by someone who else was in Warminster in, in, in those days, a chap by the name of Mike Oram, who has written a book called Does It Rain in Other Dimensions? Uh, Mike has actually been over to uh, Area 51, and has also um, seen and experienced some very strange things in that area. So whether or not we are actually not touched, but whether or not there are are certain people who are more in tune with the phenomenon, I don't know. Well, listen, uh, Kevin, uh, it's been a pleasure to speak with you today. Definitely like to stay in touch with you, and um, perhaps we can uh, get together again and, and discuss this in a little more detail. Uh, but I wanted to, before we go, I wanted to give out your your website and then also your book again. The website is ufo-warminster.co.uk. Um, and again, then the uh, the book is UFO Warminster Cradle of Contact. Um, is there any other sites or uh, or pages or anything that uh, you you would like to give out, or does that pretty much cover it? Can they get That's to all pretty, these places through that one? That pretty much covers it. I mean, you can um, via the, the the UFO Warminster website, you can contact myself and Steve Jimmy. There is also a Facebook page, uh, UFO Warminster. Oh, okay. Very good. Yeah, which I run. Um, so, I mean, yeah, that, that's really basically about it. I mean, you know, keeping a full-time job, or, <laughs> or well, um, you know, and writing, researching, because I'm also uh, looking at, at, at writing another book, which is, in some respects, non-UFO based. Uh, I mean, if any of your listeners will know the name of Jerry Anderson... Uh, who was the man behind Thunderbirds, Stingray, Captain Scarlet, all those classic uh, sci-fi programs. Um, I also run a a webpage on Facebook as well for him, R.I.P. Jerry Anderson. Um, uh, I'm working on a a little project at the moment, hopefully, which will see fruition along with Jerry's son, Jamie. So I am absolutely sort of inundated. You know, when I'm I'm not free, um, I'm at work, and when I'm free, I'm tied to this computer. (laughs) Well, listen, I appreciate you taking out the time to talk to us uh, today, Kevin. I really do. Um, it, it's, it's been a pleasure, and I have learned uh, a lot, uh, I must say. Um, I'm always uh, amazed uh, by people's experiences and, and the knowledge they have on ufology. Uh, um, it's just a very, very strange topic. Is it not? It is indeed. <laughs> and I mean, if, if, if anybody has, you know, been, had their interest piqued by this, I would also suggest that they track down Arthur Shuttlewood's books as well, because obviously, although they're a little bit more uh, sensationalist than they should be, I suppose, um, you know, it will give someone also a very good grounding in the warmest UFO phenomenon. Very good. Very good. Well, I'll definitely uh, uh, include that in the overall graphics here on screen. Well, listen, Kevin, thanks again. Um, It's been a pleasure, like I said, and we will stay in touch and uh, keep looking up up in the sky. I will do indeed. You never know one of these days I might see something else I can't explain. Uh, And please let me know when you do. I will, Rick. (laughs) Okay. Kevin, you have a good evening. Thank you, Rick. Uh Uh-huh. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.